67 years old and I climbed Mount Everest this year, summited the mountain on May 23rd and became the oldest American to summit Mount Everest. And I've also climbed the highest mountain on every other continent and I did that after reaching age 60. So I think I'm the oldest person to, to climb the highest mountain on every continent after reaching age 60. I grew up in Burbank, California. I've always loved the mountains, I've always loved adventure. I think, I think it's just in my genes and my blood to be an ad adventuresome type of person. I started climbing as kind of a hobby when I was living in Hong Kong, I'm practicing law with an international law firm. And I had weekends free, and I would use those weekends to go out into the local mountains around Hong Kong and, and uh, climb, or probably more, what you would call hike the country trails in Hong Kong. Then I moved to Tokyo and I started climbing mountains in Tokyo. I did Mount Fuji twice. And then I was re reassigned back to New York City. And I then started climbing some of the peaks on the East Coast, the Adirondacks, the Catskills, the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And that just evolved eventually into the big mountains, the high altitude peaks, what we call alpine climbing. And I found as I started to get into mountain climbing that it was a great uh, way for me to relax and unwind and realize what's really important in life. While climbing helps Bill focus on what is important in his life, what's important to the success of each climb is the training and preparation of mind, body, and soul. It's really important to be in great physical condition, there's no doubt about that, especially on a mountain like Everest, which is 29,035 feet. It's a seven-week trip. You're climbing up and down the mountain multiple times to acclimatize your body. So it is physically very exerting. There isn't anything about that mountain that's easy. It was the hardest of the our eight summits that I climbed. So you need to be in great physical condition and I have a regular training regime that I use and I've used for years now which includes a health club membership and I get into the health club uh, to work out. The second part of it is climbing in the local mountains. We're blessed in Southern California to have some great peaks right near us and the best training you can do is to actually get in the mountains and climb. And the third aspect of my training regimen which is my favorite is on Sundays I take my grandson Oliver who's disabled and I have a trailer and I hook the trailer to my bike and I pull him behind my bike for 40 to 50 mile rides in the mountains here in Southern California and along the coast and it's a great opportunity for the two of us to get together and, and train together. So I call him my training partner. The other parts that are equally if not more important are mental preparation. You really need to be prepared mentally. Uh, and the fourth and equally important aspect of it, at least for me, is spiritual. And having the right spiritual attitude towards the mountains and belief in, in, uh, in your maker and in belief in yourself. This was my third attempt, so I didn't make it on my first attempt. I failed two times before, but I didn't let that stop me. I just learned from my prior climbs, what I needed to do differently. I did that this year and it was a great, great year for me. It's just a wonderful feeling to set a goal, whatever it might be in life, and, and eventually uh, realize it. Reaching the peak of Everest is the ultimate for climbers, but because the obstacles and challenges are so extreme, very few succeed. On Mount Everest, you have base camp and then four camps on the mountain, uh, and in the Kumbu Icefall, which is the first portion of the mountain you climb above base camp, the glacier has broken up pretty badly and as the glacier breaks up it creates these giant crevasses and those crevasses can go down, they're like caverns that can go down six or seven stories. To get across the crevasses they put ladders across them. These are just aluminum ladders that you'd see in a hardware store and where the crevasse is really huge they may strap three or four ladders together. And what you have to do is get on those ladders with all your gear on your back and your boots and your crampons and cross these ladders. And as you cross, you look down and you just, you can't even see the bottom, it's so far down. And it's pretty, I would say that that for me and for most people that climb Mount Everest on the south side is the scariest part of the climb because even though you're not a high up on the mountain, it is pretty uh, awesome when you look down and see a, a six or seven hundred foot drop if you were to fall off the ladder. The way it works on a big mountain like Everest because of the altitude, which is 29,035 feet, you move up the mountain in successive steps. So you'll go up to camp one, then come back down, and then 
rest at base camp for a few days, then you go up to camp one and then camp two, and then you come back down to base camp for a week. And then you, on your third rotation, typically you move up from camp one to camp two to camp three and sleep at camp three, which is at 23,000 feet. And then you go all the way back down to base camp for at least a week. And then the fourth rotation is when you go to the summit. Now my summit day was pretty exciting on Mount Everest. When we got to about 28,000 feet and a humongous storm rolled in from uh, the Bay of Bengal and slammed into the mountain as we were high up on the southeast ridge. So we were caught in a storm on, on my summit day. About five minutes or 10 minutes from the summit, you come up over a rise just above the Hillary Step. And as I came up over that rise, I could see these people sitting down. And I thought, I wonder why they're sitting down. Why would they be sitting down? There were probably 10 or 12 of them just sitting there. And then I realized they're on the summit celebrating. And I knew at that moment in time that I was gonna make it. It was only five or 10 minutes, just a few steps, and, and I was there. Made the summit and came back down successfully to, to Camp 4. So to reach the summit in those conditions, which were horrendous weather conditions, the worst I've ever experienced in the mountain, was a really great sense of satisfaction for me. And the symbol of success for Bill is the same at the peak of all his expeditions. I got several summit shots of me on the top holding my American flag. I'm a very patriotic person and everybody knows that. And so I take the American flag with me. I have the same flag I've been using since I started climbing, and I take that flag with me to the, uh, to the summit of every mountain that I climb. And the first thing I do when I reach the summit, for instance, Mount Everest this year when we were up there in the storm, is I drop down to my knees and thank the Lord for the, for the safe trip and ask the Lord to get us all down safely out of the storm, which he did. But the second thing I do is I pull out that American flag and I hold it up and I get a photo of me holding a flag on, on the summit of, uh, of these mountains that I climb. And I've done that on every peak that I've climbed. Making it to the summit of the highest mountain on every continent is an incredible accomplishment. But for Bill, one definitely stands above the others. My favorite climb has to be Mount Everest. When I was on Mount Everest this year climbing it, I felt like I was standing on sacred ground every moment I was there. Just to have the privilege and the honor to put my foot on that mountain, whether I made it up or not, was, was so awesome. And it's a combination of external elements that make it all possible. But you do need to have the support of your family, there's no doubt about that. It's a risky hobby. Uh, climbing Mount Everest is, is of course extra risky because it's Mount Everest. And then it's also important to have the support of a team on the mountain. I did an unguided trip, so I, I didn't have a guide with me, but I did have a Sherpa that I hired. His name was Mingma, and we've become so close. We're like brothers now, but he was a huge help to me. The gear, of course, that you have for a, a high-altitude alpine climb can be very expensive. The down suits that you wear are $800 to over $1,000. The boots, the millet boots, the Everest boots are $500. Everything is very expensive, but then you've got to also hire a trekking company to help get your gear up to base camp and set up the camps on the mountain. That ranges anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $30,000 if you do an unguided climb, which I did, all the way up to seventy-five dollars to $125,000 if you do a fully guided climb. After conquering the summits, what could possibly be left to accomplish? I would like to trek to the North Pole and the South Pole on skis, pulling a sled behind me with, with my gear and provisions. And if you climb the seven summits and you trek to the north and south pole on skis, that's called the Grand Slam. Though many of us will never even reach one of the summits, we can experience them all through Bill. I love speaking. I've, I have so many programs that I've given and uh, I'm giving in the future for all different groups. Uh, children in schools who I love to speak to, but I also speak to a lot of senior citizens. It's just great fun, I really enjoy it. I've done programs at colleges and universities. Well, my advice, my story, I always like to say, is not a story about me or my accomplishments. My story really is about the mountains uh, because I love them so much and they've meant so much to me. But beyond that, it's also a story, as I mentioned earlier, about dreams, dreaming big, committing yourself to a goal, working hard to achieve it, learning from your mistakes, never giving up, and ultimately succeeding. That's really what my story is about.